I wrote a little something about my pastor, if you don't mind me reading that before I preach. My pastor changed the pulpit, and he painted over oak. He moved those lovely pillars. Why, I'm going to have a stroke. He bought some brand new cameras and left them in plain sight and put in new black choir chairs. You know that can't be right. Well, I like all the changes. They're improvements, don't you see? They put our focus on the preaching where it ought to be. The old pulpit was larger than this new one in its place, but so was the old pastor. <laughs> Wipe that smile off of your face. But if I didn't like them, I would never once complain. You'd never hear me singing out a critical refrain. I'd care not if the chairs were orange and the pulpit red. If we had fuchsia ceilings, not one word would then be said. For while those things are helpful, sharp and classy as can be, they're really quite irrelevant, I think you must agree. It's what the choir sings and not the chairs in which they sit. It's what's preached from the pulpit, not the size or shape of it. My pastor preaches Bible truths with power and with grace. His family stories always put a smile upon my face. His gospel invitation is consistent, clear, and plain. And to the King James Bible, true and firm, he does remain. He's led us very wisely through these most confusing days and kept us going forward in some quite creative ways. He put the church on television every single week and uses social media to many lost souls seek. He's brought us back together with discernment at this time, although I guess that technically this still might be a crime. <laughs> He's kept us all connected via live stream, Facebook too, and raised our spirits, kept our minds on what is good and true a year. It seems like yesterday, and yet it seems so long. Who could have known so many things in our world would go wrong? If I had known the crisis that was coming into play, I promise you it's true, I would have still left anyway. <laughs> God's man was ready. He has proved his leadership and care. He's loved us and encouraged us and helped our burdens bear. So happy anniversary, my pastor, friend, and son. You've done so well, but I'm convinced the best is yet to come. Thank you, Pastor Howell. It's his rule. If he wants to break it, God bless you. Well, I see I'm supposed to preach from Daniel. So open your Bible to Daniel chapter 3. I had just finished a sermon from this passage, uh, maybe a week or two earlier, came to church and heard our pastor preach on Daniel chapter 3. And having the sermon's been just what we needed during these times and these days. And thank you, faithful church. I want to tell you a story before I preach. I was at another place and a young lady came to see me. She's married, got children. And I did not know this when it was going on. I didn't know it until everybody was gone. But she was in this church as a young girl, and her father mistreated her in the most awful ways imaginable. And she's in a good church, and she's serving God. And she's happy, and she's got a good marriage, and raising her kids right. And she said, you know what helped me make it through all that mess? Her father was a terrible hypocrite. And said one thing and lived another. But she said, what helped me make it was our church. I saw there were people there that did love God, that were real, and I said, that's what I want for my family. So I'd like to encourage the First Baptist Church of Bridgeport to just keep being the First Baptist Church. We've got a great pastor, we've got a great future, and I'm so glad you're here tonight. Daniel chapter 3, and I'm going to begin reading about verse 8. Wherefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man that shall hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, sultry, dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worship it, that he should be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews who now has set up over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in his rage and fury, 
commanded to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not ye serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? Now, if you be ready, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if ye worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is, read me the next two words out loud. Let's try it again. Who is that God? A generation of people who disagreed with him politically never referred to, Je to President Franklin Delano Roosevelt by name. They just called him that man in the White House. Our president referred to our governor as that woman in Michigan. It's not a kind expression. It's not a respectful reference. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we are not careful to answer thee in this matter. If it be so, read me the next two words. Our God. Who is that God? That God is, ever say that with me, that God is our God. That God is our God. <laughs> you want to know? I know. I know him really well, Nebuchadnezzar. I can tell you exactly what he's going to do. Our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. And he commanded the most mighty men that were in his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to cast them into the burning fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their coats, their hose, and their hats, their other garments, and they were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace exceeding hot, the flame of the fire slew those men that took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down, bound into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished. And rose up in haste and spake and said unto his counselors, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. I'll talk to you a little bit tonight. God help me on this thought. That God is our God. Lord, would you bind the devil and his demons and keep them from interfering with the work you want to do and help our hearts to be open and attentive to all you have for us. Help me to say only that which would please you. And Lord, I want to rely entirely on your power and strength. So give me that which I do not have and could never have without you. Draw us to yourself. Bless the preaching. Bless the invitation. Continue to bless, bless this wonderful church. Thank you for our pastor. Thank you for his wise and careful leadership and his vision. Even in a time of, of people thinking you have to shut down, he's taken us forward. So grateful. Bless this time. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Nebuchadnezzar knew something of the God of the Jews. He knew that he could give the answer to a dream he had that none of his counselors could give. He called him a revealer of secrets and a king of kings and a god of gods. He knew there was something special about him. But there was one person at least that Nebuchadnezzar regarded far more highly than he regarded the God of the Jews, and that was himself. Nebuchadnezzar was back from a great victory over the Israeli army and over the Syrian army and he comes back and his soldiers are victorious, his treasuries are prosperous, his people are obsequious and Nebuchadnezzar liked it that way. He loved to use fear and intimidation to rule. You read through the book of Daniel and he's always telling people, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to cut you in pieces and make your house a dunghill. I hate it when that happens. Of course, after you're cut in pieces, it doesn't much matter what they do to your house. 
Yeah. Nebuchadnezzar, feeling his oats, feeling supreme in his power, puts up a great image 90 feet high in the plain of Dura. He makes everybody come, all the princes and all the lords and all the leaders and all of the people had to gather around. And he said, I'm going to have this music play. And when the music plays, everybody bow down to the image that I have prepared. That's his demand. This demand is accompanied by an impressive extravaganza of music and leaders and ordinary people and a great host all gathered in the plain of Dura. But it's not only a demand that has an expressive impressive extravaganza to accompany it. It's a demand that has an inclusive expectation. You will all bow down to my image. Now, I don't really think Nebuchadnezzar expected much resistance. I think the furnace was a, a show of force. Here was a man who with a nod of his head could set someone free and with a flick of his wrist could have someone's head removed from them. Here is a man whose word is absolute law. And here is a man who's already been in his mind very generous to the Jews. He's allowed them to continue to worship their God. He has no objection. In fact, he likes their God. He thinks their God is powerful. He's glad their God had given them the answer to the dream that his counselors and wise men and soothsayers could not give him. They just have to worship his God too. Only the Jews at that time were exclusive in their worship. Only the Jews said there is only one God. This kind of demand would be made later on in the New Testament era. When Caesar would say that you had to acknowledge he was Lord, you could worship Jesus, you could have uh, uh, your affinity and your affection for him, but you just had to give a little pinch of salt and just once a year or so say that Caesar is Lord and he'd be all right. And the Christians said, oh no, we only have one God. Didn't our Savior say, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And so the demand is followed by disobedience. Let me give you a little explanation. Bible scholars, if you just study the, the, the people that Nebuchadnezzar took, will tell you there are about 10,000 Jews in Babylon at this time. 9,000, 900, and 97 of them, unless they're out of town, bowed. Three didn't. Now, what they did was not, they didn't go to the capital carrying guns. And they certainly didn't go there carrying nooses. I want nothing to do with that nonsense. I'm all for your right to carry a gun. I don't want to need to brandish one in the capital. But they, uh, they didn't have a banner. They didn't wave their hand or shake their fist in defiance. They weren't giving some symbol of rebellion at the Olympics. No, you know what they did? They just did what everybody else had been doing a few minutes before. They just stood. They didn't change anything. They just kept doing what they had done before. And, and it was a big deal to the folks around there. They were envious of these Jews. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, you promoted these Jews. You brought in these outsiders and you gave them a place over us. And they're not bowing down now. That's exactly what drives the world crazy about us. They don't mind we have church. Usually. Uh, they don't mind we believe the Bible, at least parts of it. They don't mind that we pray and they don't mind that we sing our songs. And they're not even all that upset that we leave a gospel tract on the table after we order a meal at the restaurant or at least to give it to the lady at the drive thru As long as we worship their God too. So Hillary Clinton said when it comes to abortion, religious beliefs will have to change. Our governor, at her first state of the state address, I was as close to her, closer than I am to Pastor Howe right now, and I heard her say it. She said, we're going to have equal rights in hiring and employment for the LGBTQ community. And then she said these words very clearly, very plainly, and very pointedly, no exceptions. You know what that meant? The Republicans said, weren't all excited about amending the civil rights law to include gender, transgender issues, and those kinds of things. 
uh, sexual orientation. But they said, uh, we'll do it, but you have to put an exception in for religious organizations. You have to make it so that uh, those who it's against their conscience uh, hire people who practice certain behaviors don't have to do it. And our governor said, no exceptions. You can have your God. You better worship my God too. Pete Buttigieg, running for president, said that no religious organization that refused to hire homosexuals should be given a tax exemption. No, don't you dare fail to bow the knee to our God. What we say, what we think, what we believe, you must acknowledge is correct. Their disobedience is followed by defiance on the part of the king. Though they're quite respectful and they just keep standing when everybody else sits down. By the way, uh, you're going to get in trouble sometimes as long as if you don't bow down when everybody else does. Nobody noticed Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego until everybody else bowed down. And the king is angry. It's personal. The Bible says he responds in rage and fury. He, he, uh, he's totally upset. He's taking it personally and it's prideful. He said, you're not worshiping the image I have set up. I, my image, my law, my order, my requirement. But it was a little bit problematic. Nothing happened when Nebuchadnezzar put his image out there. No intervention by God when he brings out all that music and he tells everybody to bow down to his image. But now Nebuchadnezzar makes it a contest between him and God. Who is that God that will deliver you out of the furnace if you don't bow down to the image that I have set up? I can see the sneer on his lips. I note the set of his countenance. I hear the scorn in his voice as he said, look at there's the furnace. There's my soldiers. Here's my kingdom. I'm the most powerful man in the world. You tell me who is that God that's going to get you out of this fix. I think the world, a lot of them love to see the church in trouble. <laughs> and I think God loves to see the world, love to see the church in trouble, and then loves to deliver his people. And so the three Hebrew children respond with a declaration. It's a declaration of faith. They say, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. You see, uh, Mr. King, you know a little bit about our God, but you don't know all about him. Oh, you know that he can reveal the answer to a dream. He can make a secret known. You know that. But there's a lot of things you don't know about our God. You see, our God made the whole Red Sea part so that the Israeli children could walk across. And then when Pharaoh's armies followed with their chariots, he made it come back together and drown them all. In the middle of the Red Sea, that's what our God can do. Uh, our God, our God is the God that created everything out of nothing. Our God is the God that led 1.2 million adult Jews across the wilderness for 40 years and always fed them and kept their clothing from wearing out. Our God is the God who holds the world in, in order and sustains it by His own power. You know something about our God, but you don't really know our God. I think we should say to our secular, scornful of faith society, I think we should say to the LGBTQ community, the community that demands uh, we acknowledge that what they do is right and proper. I, I think we should say to an increasingly delusional media and to a bunch of uh, self-important politicians, uh, and I think we should say to all who think they are large and in charge and in control, uh, bring it on. You don't know our God. Faith, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us. But wait a minute. Their declaration of the king was only one of faith. It was one of fortitude. The next three words out of the mouth were, but if not. See, our God is God. <laughs> you know what that means? It means he can do anything he wants. Our God sitteth in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he pleased. Yeah. And sometimes God does miraculous things to deliver his children. Who through faith, the Bible says, subdued kingdoms. 
and wrought righteousness and quench the violence of the sword and stop the mouths of lions and women receive their dead back to life again and out of weakness were made strong. Man, I like that part of Hebrews 11. I'm in that crowd. I'm in the faith crowd. And then it says, and others. Others were torn in sunder, sawn in sunder. Others wandered about naked and destitute, clothed in animal skins, of whom the world was not worthy. And then it says this, these all died in faith. You see, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego weren't putting God in a box. They weren't telling God what he had to do in order to be God. They just said, our God is able. We kind of hope he does. But if it's his will for us to perish in the flame, we're still not going to bow down. But we think he'll deliver us, and we're excited about that. But either way, our God is God, and we're going to follow him, good or bad. And then we find a deliverance. Nebuchadnezzar is a typical government official in this regard. He makes the fire seven times hotter than it already is. It's already hot enough to kill anybody. Did you know it doesn't matter when you're killed if you kill with one bullet or 20 bullets? It doesn't matter if the furnace is hot enough to kill you instantly or seven times hot enough to kill you instantly. You're just equally dead. Then he said, make it seven times hotter. They make it so hot that he gets his strongest soldiers and they go to throw in the three Hebrew children. They tie them up tight and leave all their clothing on and they throw them and they fall down into the furnace. They don't go on their feet. They, they're down. <clears throat> and the king looks out and he said, what, 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 wait, wait a minute. And he gets his counselor and said, now didn't we take three men and tie them up and throw them in the furnace? Yes, sir. How can I see four men? And they're loose. And they're walking around. The fiery furnace gave them freedom. It burned not their hair and not their clothing and not their shoes, but it burned the things that bound them. Can I tell you, the world can try to stop the church of Jesus Christ. The world can try to stop the gospel of Jesus Christ, but no persecution can stop the gospel. You sometimes just set us free. The church in China had three or four million believers when the communists took over and the previous regime of Chiang Kai-shek was overthrown. And now under that God Godless, oppressive, harsh regime. There are not three or four million. There are 80 to 90 million believers. And I'm told that soon there'll be more Christians by number, not by percentage, but by number in the land of China than any other country on the, on the face of this earth. Go ahead, tie us up. God can loose us. But he not only gave them freedom, in his deliverance he gave them fellowship. The form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Our God is great and high and lifted up and worthy of our worship, but our God is real and personal and close and dwells within us. And He doesn't just say, I'll send my angel to take you out of the fiery furnace. He said, I'm going to come down and fellowship with you myself. And anybody who's been through a trial and tried to be faithful will tell you that some of the greatest fellowship and some of the greatest encouragement and some of the greatest communion they have with God has been in the time of the trial. We have not an high priest who cannot be test tempted, uh, uh, touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but there's an all point tempted like as we are and yet without sin. We have a sympathetic Savior and he never leaves us or forsakes us. And then a part of their deliverance, he gave them favor. They were promoted. Uh, uh, they, 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 the king said, you, you, you trusted your God. And you yielded your bodies to him. And because of that, you've changed my word. And I'm making a new decree. you got to worship the God of the Jews. Or I'll cut you in pieces and make your house a dunghill. He was uh, convinced of God. I don't think he was converted yet. He still had some pagan tendencies. <laughs> Who is that God? Yeah. Who is that God? That God is. 
Who is that God the LGBTQ crowd says that is going to keep you from hiring us? We don't care if it violates your conscience or your book. Who is that God that is going to be able to keep the gospel going out during a pandemic and a virus? Who is that God that will provide for you? Who is that God that is more powerful than the king? Who is more God that will protect you in the fire? Who is that God that will be present in your time of trial? Who is that God that will promote you when it's all over? That God is our God. That God that got Peter and James out of jail and had them preaching the next day at the same spot. That God is our God. That God that took 300 unarmed, untrained Hebrew men and defeated an army of 135,000 Midianites. That God is our God. That God that took the stone out of the sling of a shepherd and guided it so that it hit the giant in the only unprotected place of his body and took his life and won a victory for all the people of God with a 15 year old boy. That God is our God. That God that killed 185,000 Syrian soldiers soldiers in their sleep and had the enemy routed without his people having to unsheath a sword or hurl a spear. That God is our God. John G. Patton arrived in the New Hebrides Islands in November of 1858. Everybody there was a cannibal. Nobody there was a Christian. Other missionaries had gone and failed and had met with some very unhappy circumstances and ends. A man named Dixon said to the young John G. Patton, Son, don't you dare go there. You'll be eaten by cannibals. Mr. Dixon was older, a good man, a godly man. Mr. Patton said, Sir, at your advanced age, your body will soon be eaten by worms. (laughs) And it makes no difference to me whether mine is eaten by cannibals or worms. My resurrection body will be just as fair as yours. He went, got there in November, February 12th, he had a son born. Nineteen days later, his wife died. And seventeen days after that, the son died, and John G. Patton had to sleep on the graves of first his wife and then his wife and son so the cannibals wouldn't dig up the bodies and eat them. His book is on the internet. I recommend it to you. It's an old book, great book. John G. Patton faced all kinds of difficulties and trials and problems in his time there, but he always trusted God and he always persevered. One time he was delivered just to the last moment as a ship that he'd been hoping to come and hadn't come came just when he needed it. One night an angry chieftain with a group of his followers surrounded Patton's little hut where he lived and Patton was sure they were going to come and overpower him and kill him and eat him. And he prayed. And they never came in. About a year later, that chief had gotten saved. And Patton said, Chief, why didn't you come and attack me that night? You had everybody ready. I was all alone. He said, are you kidding me? There were a hundred soldiers with sharp swords standing all around your hut. (laughs) The angel of the Lord encampeth round about them that fear him and delivereth him. And that God is our God. John G. Patton lived to see the entire island of Aniwa, one of the New Hebrides Islands, converted to Christianity. And almost everybody in those islands become a follower of Jesus Christ. And it is said that when John G. Patton came to the New Hebrides Islands, there was not a single Christian. They were all cannibals. And when his life was over and his ministry ended, there was not a single cannibal. They were all Christians. Charles Darwin the uh, author of the book Origin of Species, the father of evolution, took a journey on his ship, the Beagle, and when he was writing the book, and he came to the New Hebrides Islands, and Charles Darwin, I'm told, said this, I do not believe in God. But if I were to believe in God, it would be because of what I've seen at the New Hebrides Islands and the work and ministry of John G. Patton. And that God is our God. Maybe we don't need to be too upset about what the government does. <laughs> Maybe we don't need to worry too much. We just got to get up every day and serve our God. Maybe we don't need to worry if we're a little short on finances because he does uh, have all the riches of, of the universe at his disposal. Maybe we, uh, maybe we could find grace to be nice to people we're quarantined with. If that God is our God. 
Who is that God, the sovereign scoffed in anger, scorn and rage, that can remove you from the fire, your pain and hurt assuage? Who is that God that can deliver three unbowing men, release their bonds, protect from burning, set them free again? Your God reveals my dreams and makes you strong and wise, it's true. But I'm the king, and there are things I know your God can't do. My furnace burns at seven times its necessary heat. No God can save you from its flame or my decree defeat. Who is that God, you ask, O king, a sneer upon your face? Your anger poured on all who your command do not, do not embrace? Who is that God, you ask, your face contorted by your rage? Why, I'm the greatest man on earth, the ruler of my age. I've conquered kingdoms, built great cities, ruled my world, and now you all must worship as I bid you. To my image bow. What God exceeds my might and power? Name him, if you will. But when it's over, you'll be dead, and I'll be sovereign still. The answer from God's children came without a second thought. No agonizing worries of the flame so fierce and hot. No pleading, no negotiating, no remorse or tear. The answer to your question is our God. We love and fear. Our God is able, powerful, and sovereign over all. He'll help us. He'll deliver us as on his name we call. Your furnace so consuming, your image oh so high, are nothing to the King of kings who hears our every cry. That God is our God, and you'll see just what our God can do. He'll help us. He'll deliver us. He'll always see us through. That God is our God, and he's the only God, you see. He promises his children perfect peace and victory. So in the fire, three Hebrew children clothed and bound were thrown. The power of the potentate would soon to all be known. The king in smug self-confidence would sit and watch them burn. And all the earth to him would then in fear and reverence turn. The flames so hot, the keepers died while casting in the three, yet not a hair was singed. They were as safe as they could be. Their clothing unaffected, no alarm and no despond. The only thing that burned on those three children was their bond. But wait, the king's advisors have a startling report. They strain to see with whom those unbound men do now consort. There are four men, the king declares, who in the furnace trod, and that fourth man... He looks exactly like the Son of God. Their bodies were protected, neither thread nor hair was singed. They never ran, they showed no fear, they never even twinged. But better than deliverance from fury, heat and flame, the fact that God who rescued them within their presence came. So when the critics mock our faith and freedoms try to take, Remember, they're repeating that vain potentate's mistake. Another petty tyrant with another brash decree. Another prideful ruler saying we must bend the knee. Another unbeliever thinking they are in control. Another who would bind our bodies and command our soul. Another one who dares to challenge our great deity. Another who demands that subject to them we must be. It's just another chance for God's protection to be shown. Another opportunity to make his power known, another illustration of deliverance and love bestowed upon his children by our gracious God above. That God is our God. He created and controls the world and laughs when petty challenges by men at him are hurled. He sits up in the heavens doing all he does desire. And comes to help his children and walk with them through the fire. So let the heathen thunder. Let them threaten to destroy. And let them every power in this world try to employ. But hold this truth fast in your heart as you walk on earth's sod. That God who can deliver us has always been our God. That God is our God. Father in heaven, help us to love you and trust you. Help us to be willing, like the three Hebrew children, to be consumed by the fire, if that would please you. But to believe that it is nothing for you to deliver us from the most difficult circumstance we could imagine. Help us to be grateful that that God is our God. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, nobody's looking around. I wonder if you're here tonight, you say, Brother Willette, if I died today, I'd go to heaven, I'm God's child, but... The Spirit of God has dealt with me and I need to do some business with Him. I wish you'd pray for me. If you say that, would you slip your hand up? God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I'm God's child and I need to do business with Him. I've been been worrying. I've been fretting. I've been complaining. I've been getting upset at human beings and not trusting in the God of gods. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they never got mad at the king. 
they just kept standing. And when they went in the furnace, they still kept standing. God put them back on their feet. Maybe you're here tonight or maybe you're watching. You don't know if you died today that you'd for sure have a home in heaven. You know, God loves you. He loves you so much. He wants to have you spend eternity with him. But there's a problem that keeps us from heaven. That's our sin. All of sin can come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death. But the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ, born of a virgin, God becoming man, living perfectly for a third of a century on this earth, and then dying, shedding his blood, rising from the grave for our sin. The wage of sin is death. Christ died for our sin. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you're not sure of heaven, you can be sure. I'd like to invite you to pray a simple prayer. Praying the prayer is not a magic procedure. Saying the words doesn't mean anything, but meaning what the words say will change everything forever. I'm going to invite you to say, Lord, I admit I'm a sinner. I don't deserve to go to heaven. I know I can't save myself. I believe you sent your son, Jesus, to die on the cross for me. I trust Jesus and him alone to forgive my sin, to become my savior, to take me to heaven when I would just say that to him. Lord, work in the hearts of these who are watching and those who are here. Help us to please you by our response in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand, please? Heads bowed, eyes closed. Spirit of God has spoken in your heart. You want to find a place at the altar to do business with God? The invitation is open. You can come on right now. If you're home and you pray that prayer and ask Jesus to save you, Pastor would like to send you a gift, a book to help you in your Christian life. You just contact the church with information on the screen, and they'll get it to you. I just want to be a blessing and an encouragement. Maybe you're here tonight you need to obey the Lord in baptism. Maybe you're here and you're saved and baptized, not a part of this church family, and you ought to come. Let the folks know that's what God wants. We'll welcome you here. This church has only two requirements for membership. You have to be saved and you have to be scripturally baptized. That's it. Christian friend, maybe it's good to bend the knee and say thank you for the reminder that that God is our God. It's not just a, an ancient story. It's the same God who has the same power and the same love for his children as he has all through the Bible. 